Isn't he a good father? Happy, happy Father's Day to you. We're glad you're here. Uh, Normally on Mother's Day, we say Happy Mother's Day and everybody goes, Woo! I understand why we don't do that because fathers are not celebrated in this country like they used to be celebrated. There are some reasons for that. We will not take the time to get into all of that today because I believe on this Father's Day I am coming with a specific word for this body and for the fathers today and the mothers uh, and for, by the way, the children. If you have your Bibles and you will, turn to the book of Genesis chapter number 22. Genesis chapter 22. We'll begin reading in verse number 9. If I were to entitle this message today, it would simply be, What do you do when the cost is too great? What do you do when the cost is too great? Genesis chapter 2, beginning in verse number 9. And they came to the place which God had told him of. Stop right there. If you underline in your Bibles, I want you to underline those words. And they came to the place which God had told him. Not where Daddy had told him. Not where Grandma had told him. But they came to the place where God had told him of. And Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar Upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not your hand upon the lad, neither do you anything unto him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing that you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah-Jireh. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. And the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time and said, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, That in blessing I will bless you, and in multiplying I will multiply your seed as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and your seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in your seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned unto his young men, and they rose up and went together to Beersheba, and Abraham dwelt at Beersheba. Let us pray. Father, today in the name that is above every name, the name of of our good, good Father, the name of the one who supplies, the name of the one who provides, you are Jehovah Jireh our provider, Jehovah Rapha, our healer, Jehovah Shalom, our peace. It is in this name that we declare and decree today by the word of the Lord uh, that there are things that you are saying to this body, to this people, to the world today. And he who has ears to hear, may we stop whatever it is we're doing today and open the eyes of our heart that we may that we may see what you are doing in this season, that we may hear what you're saying in this season, and we'll give you the glory for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen and Amen. You may be seated today in the presence of the Lord. In each, in each season of life, there are... There are ups and there are downs. When I, when I uh, became a father, uh, man, that was the proudest moment of my life. And, and we went into the hospital because, you know, I didn't have to do any work. It was all my wife doing the work and going through the pain and going through the suffering. And, and so I showed up on time to that hospital. And then I walked in that place and, and, uh, and I watched her give birth to our two children. And, 
And uh, man, I was a proud daddy and people were coming by to see us and I was holding that kid. Uh, but we got that, those children home and I figured out something really quick. Uh, that every season of life has, has ups and it has downs. The proud papa uh, that was in the hospital was now uh, getting up at 3 o'clock in the morning to change diapers. No one ever told me about that stuff. Uh, I had heard people joke about it, but I had never experienced that. And so I only could understand from what I had experienced. Uh, my children are the greatest gifts that have ever been given me, uh, but I'm having to tell you those children come with responsibility. And when, I, when my wife birthed those children into the world, it was so wonderful. And, and then they gave them their first bath and they used that, that baby lotion on them, you know. And you just, you could, you could cradle them in your arms and you could sniff them. And they just, my wife still likes to, wants you all to have babies so that she can smell them and then give them back to you. Uh, babies smell really good uh, until they mess themselves. And then they don't smell really good. Once they mess themselves, the whole season changes, but the responsibility of being a daddy is still there. In our text today, Abraham received his seed of promise, and one day God tells Abraham, you know the story, I want you to take this son that I have promised you, that I have given to you, and now you have enjoyed yourself, and you've had it easy, but now Abraham, I'm going to require something of you. I want you to take your son and I want you to take him to a place that I will show you and there I want you to sacrifice your boy. I want you to sacrifice your seed of promise. I want you to take your seed of promise and I want you to lay him on an altar and I want you to kill him. In that moment, Abraham had a decision that he had to make. Whose son was this? This is the part of the story that you have considered. This is the part of the story that you have thought on and meditated on. I'm going to uh, bring this Father's Day message around to a different point of view uh, that you may have never seen before. Uh, when I study the Word of God, I always like to study the chapter before it and the chapter's behind it to find out what happened before this and what happened after this. In the, in the context of this message today, we're going to find out what the Bible says happened after Abraham obeyed. You ready? Here it goes. Never again does it say that Abraham had a wonderful relationship with his son. In fact, Isaac is never mentioned again until Abraham dies and Isaac and Ishmael come together and bury their father. Well, this is a no-duh moment. If my daddy ever tried to kill me, I wouldn't have anything to do with him either. Never again in all of Scripture does it say that Isaac was found with his father. Never again does it say that they had wonderful communication together. Never does it say Abraham took Isaac hunting. Never again does it say that Abraham took Isaac fishing. Never! And the only time Isaac is mentioned again as it refers to the life of Abraham, is when Isaac and Ishmael, you know Ishmael, that one son that Abraham had uh, because he went into his wife's handmaid at the urging of his wife and he committed adultery with her and there she got pregnant and there she had a son called Ishmael and, because God, and, and God said, because you did not believe me, this seed shall rise up against the seed of Isaac for all of eternity. As long as the earth remains, the seed of Ishmael will rise against the seed of Isaac and they will cause great problems and they will cause great pain. Today we see it in the Middle East all of the time, the sons of Ishmael rising in opposition to the sons of Isaac. Oh, 
so here's what I take from this passage of Scripture. This son, Ishmael, who Abraham uh, followed the leading of his wife and got rid of him, the Bible says, if you'll read pa the passages of Scripture, it says that Sarah was jealous of her handmaid after she got pregnant and after she birthed Ishmael to the extent that Abraham ran them out of the camp. If there is any evidence whatsoever to the way Isaac felt about his father Abraham was when Abraham had died and Isaac said, I don't got to do what you say anymore, old man. I'm going to go get my brother and my brother and I, uh, we're coming to watch you die and we are coming to bury your carcass. Nobody ever thought about that before. And so the title of this message today what do you do when the cost is too great? Abraham, take your son and you sacrifice him there in the place that I will show you. Uh, listen, one of these days I'm going to die. But I haven't just told my children to do things to hear myself talk. Abraham didn't run off Ishmael just to hear himself talk and appease his wife. Because we see here in our text that if God said, no, keep Ishmael in the camp, Abraham would have kept Ishmael in the camp and it wouldn't matter what his wife said. And so then we can conclude from the story that that. God was all right with Abraham driving Ishmael away because it would have been a constant fight between the two children. Did Abraham love Ishmael? Oh, absolutely he loved Ishmael. But he knew that the best thing in the world was, was to drive Ishmael out of the camp and he sent his mama and Ishmael out into the wilderness and they almost died. Nowhere in Scripture does it say that Isaac did anything again with his father other than bury him. In fact, if you'll remember in the text, the Bible says, and this is just the way I read Scripture and it's the way I study it and it's the way I think. It says, Abraham, after this occurred, Abraham returned to his men. But it does not say that Isaac did. The Bible even makes specific reference to in, in Genesis chapter 22 that they both, Abraham and Isaac, they both went together to the place that God showed him. But as they came off the mountain, the Bible says, does not say that Isaac returned to the men. It said that Abraham did. I'm not going to make reference today as to what I believe that means, but as I, have, uh, as I have completed the introduction to this message, I think you know what I think it means. Uh, that as Abraham came off of the mountain, he came off of the mountain by himself. And Abraham alone returned to the men that he had left. Even Abraham said, as, as uh, they see the place afar off, as Abraham sees the place where he is to go in his spirit, even as he is preparing his things to go, he turns to the men and says, The lad and I will go yonder and worship and return again unto you. Abraham never said who it was that would return. But according to the word, Abraham returned. You would think that if Isaac returned, it would have said Abraham and Isaac returned. But it said Abraham returned to his young men. The next mention of Isaac is found in, in, in chapters 25, 26, somewhere around there where Isaac and Ishmael show up at the same time to bury their father. My point today is this. Men, there are people who are trying to bury you. They're trying to bury your influence. 
They are trying to bury your voice. They are trying to bury everything that is masculine in you. I, I, do, not, I do not sit in judgment of women or children today uh, because we talk different languages. We speak different languages. We're not saying the exact same thing. For instance... Uh, when I come uh, in from a long day and I walk into the kitchen, I ask my wife, what's for supper? Now, you need to understand that men uh, converse in fact and women converse in feelings. Uh, that, does, that is not putting down women and it is not raising up men. It is just a fact. Men will speak in fact and women will speak in feelings. Now that is not to say that a, man, that a man does not have feelings. We have feelings. But our feelings are motivated by fact. Women's facts are motivated by their feelings. For instance, I come in and I say, what's for supper? My wife says, well, you know, Sprouts... Sprouts, they had a sale on chicken. And I left my work. I was going to leave work early because I wanted to go to Sprouts and I wanted to get it on the table for you. And I, when I went to hit I-44, I-44 was jammed up. And so I had to go to Reesers where they weren't having a sale on chicken. And I'm just so mad and I know I failed and I know I did that. And I'm like, whoa, I just wanted to know what we were having for supper. Why can't you just say Chicken. I didn't understand it. I could not comprehend it. You want to know why? It's because she is motivated and moved by her feelings. I am motivated and moved by facts. When I said, what are we having for supper? I really just wanted to know what we were having for supper. I didn't care about all that other stuff. I didn't really want to hear all of that other stuff. I just wanted to hear the fact to answer my question. What are we having for for supper. You've heard me tell this story before. It's the, same, it's the same way when you say, honey, what do you want for supper? I don't care. All right, let's go to McDonald's. Well, I don't really want McDonald's. Okay, well, let's go down and have some fried chicken at Kentucky Fried Chicken. Well, I had chicken today for lunch. Okay, what do you want for lunch? I don't care. And so women will be motivated and moved by what they feel. Men are motivated and moved by facts. Listen, one of the most difficult things to learn, and I'm not even sure I've learned it in my tenure as a pastor, is that you have to pastor women differently than you pastor men. That is a fact. You do not pastor, and, and here's why. Women are like a jet plane. You know, a, a jet plane doesn't just come into the runway. Uh, a jet plane will circle the runway and go around and around and around and around. Some of you women are looking at me like calf stairs in a new gate. That's why your husband's unhappy. That's why your husband's unhappy because you want, to, you want to demonize your husband for being masculine, demonize your husband for being a man and not talking like you and you think that if for you to be happy, your husband is going to have to talk more like a woman. And I'm here today to tell you, if your husband talks like a woman, it means he's effeminate. And if he talks like a woman and he's effeminate, the Bible said he's going to hell. Don't shout me down when I'm preaching good. The Bible teaches us that if I'm to dwell with my wife, I'm to dwell with her in knowledge. That's what the Bible says. And we wonder why we as men can, can never understand a woman. It's because we don't really care what they're saying or how they talk. Every one of you looking at me today like, oh my, he's, he's putting down women. I love women so much I married one. I ain't putting down a woman. But she's different than me. You can't get preaching like that everywhere. Women are different than men. And my wife talks as a jet plane lands. Eventually she will, as she flies, eventually she will come in for a landing and she will tell me what's really going on. For instance, if I get home and she starts griping about the grass being tall, 
I'll call Pastor Nate and I'll go, hey, you probably need to come mow my grass. My wife is so upset, it's getting so tall. And what I did not understand was she wasn't given a care about the grass. There was something going on at work that was frustrating her and leading her down this path of, of, of just absolute frustration. And so when she came in, she circled the real problem and eventually we got to the place where we figured out the real problem. The real problem wasn't the grass. The real problem is what was happening at work. And by the way, that's hypothetical. That has never happened. I'm just saying that sometimes women are will land the plane, but they've got to go around in circles before they come in for a landing. Men, on the other hand, just get straight to the point. We come in and we will say, here's what I want for supper, chicken. I don't, have to, I don't have to tell about my day. I don't have to tell about anything that happened in order to get to the place where I say I want chicken. If I want chicken, I just want chicken. And yet, we've said that's wrong. And yet, we've said coming in and shooting straight is somehow wrong. I'm here today to tell you it's masculine. And we do things differently. And by the way, children... Oh, Lord. how gonna, Children are like women. They talk in circles. And I love it when my children talk in circles. My children will come into me. Uh, Katie will come in and she'll say, Daddy, can we talk? I say, absolutely, we can talk. And she gets, she gets in my lap and she'll talk and 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 talk. And I'll say, what's wrong? And she'll talk and talk and talk and talk. And I say, what's wrong? And she'll talk and talk and talk and talk. And I love it when that happens. Men, why don't we love it when our wives do it? Why don't we love it when our wives talk and talk and talk and talk and talk and talk and talk? It's because we believe that men and women ought to be the same. And that if we're going to live with our wives in peace, they need to become more like a man. Don't tell me that you would have rather went to Sprouts and then you had to go to Reesers and I-44 was backed up. Just tell me, chicken! And yet, for her to do that, she would have to become a man. And I cannot make my wife be a man. She is a woman. Yes, Lord. So in Genesis chapter 22, God tells Abraham, And in your seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. We want to live with our women, but we want to live with them ignorant. And we have to live with them in knowledge of who they are and what makes them tick. My wife and I have a conversation sometimes and we talk about what's called love languages. That my love language is different than hers. And ladies, I'll tell you that your men would love to talk if you celebrated more what was between their ears. God said to Abraham, because you've obeyed, I am going to bless you. Because you've obeyed, Abraham, I'm going to prosper you. Because you've obeyed, I'm going to establish you. Because you've obeyed, I am going to 
make you the head and not the tail, above and not beneath. Because you obeyed Abraham, I'm going to bless you. But what happens when you obey and there's a price to be paid for your obedience? What happens? What happens is you then have a choice. Am I going to obey? Or am I not going to obey? Am I going to live with my wife in knowledge? Or am I going to continue? Am I going to continue to be the man I've always been? Hurting her at every turn. Causing pain, emotional scars, and emotional wounds. On this Father's Day, are we going to be godly men or are we going to be just men? Today, I hope we'll choose to be godly men. Today, I hope that you will choose to obey God. What do you do? What do you do when the price is too great to obey God? You obey Him anyway. In Jesus' name. you stand to your feet with me today?